So I would like to start my video today on a slightly more serious note than is normal for me. This video is on a topic that is very important to me. It's something I take very seriously. And I really wanted to make sure that I got this video right. And to be honest, even after several reshoots, I'm not sure if this video came out the way I wanted it to be. Still, this is a conversation that is close to my heart, and you all have been fantastic. I've enjoyed the conversations we've had, so I still want to put this video out there and see where this conversation goes. As such, today, in honor of Autism Awareness Month here in the United States, I'm going to be talking about disabilities and storytelling in RPGs on this episode of The Local Disaster Tour Guide. So today, we're going to be talking about a subject that is very close to my heart, which is disabilities and storytelling. I have seen a lot of conversations lately in the RPG community surrounding the idea of including people with disabilities in gaming and surrounding the idea of representing people with disabilities in the stories that we tell and also how these different ideas add together to create better stories at our gaming tables. Probably the most well-known of these conversations have been the discussions of the combat wheelchair that I have seen in a lot of forums and a lot of videos surrounding the RPG community. Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition already has published stats for a combat wheelchair, and Pathfinder 2nd Edition will be releasing stats for a combat wheelchair, if I remember correctly, in Lost Omens The Grand Bazaar later this year. Now, this intersection of disabilities and storytelling is kind of an intersection of two major facets of my life. Obviously, I have a YouTube channel about role-playing games, so storytelling is a big part of my life. But also, people with disabilities are very close to my heart. My wife and I are both associated with two different nonprofit organizations in our community that serve adults with developmental disabilities. In fact, when I'm not laid off due to a pandemic, I was actually one of the people that trained volunteers for one of those organizations so that people could come in and work with the different individuals that we served. When my wife and I got married, several of our invitations actually went out to members of the IDD community here in our hometown. So working with people with disabilities has been a big part of our family, and as you can see, this conversation about disabilities and storytelling is an intersection of two different areas of my life that are a pretty big part of who I am. As such, I really wanted to spend some time talking about these issues because I'm very excited to see the RPG community move in this direction. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I just want to lend my voice to the conversation about how we can do this well. When we talk about including people with disabilities in our gaming groups, when we talk about representing people with disabilities in our stories, 
And when we talk about just telling better stories with these ideas, there are a lot of nuances to that conversation. How can the RPG community be more welcoming? How can we modify our games so that people with disabilities are better able to participate? When we represent people with disabilities in our games, how do we do that well? How do we do that respectfully? And to be a little technical, how do we represent those things mechanically inside of the game? And ultimately, how do we use all of these different ideas to tell better stories at our gaming tables? This topic truly has a lot of different facets that the RPG community should consider and consider carefully so that we can do this well. Ultimately, because of the complexity of these conversations, what I decided to do is I decided to do a mini-series on the subject of disabilities and storytelling, and I'm breaking this into two videos. This video is going to be on the disabilities half, or more specifically, on understanding disabilities. And then the follow-up video, the second video in the series, I'm going to talk more about the storytelling half, how we can use these ideas to tell better games. So I will admit up front that this video is going to be gaming light compared to some of my other videos. What I'm doing in this video is I'm actually taking the volunteer training that I used to do for the local nonprofit and I'm condensing it and modifying it slightly to fit the RPG community so that I can address two questions at once. How can we relate better to people with disabilities who want to game with us? And how can we represent people with disabilities well in our games? So don't worry too much, I will be including some gaming tips in this video because I do think that's relevant to the conversation. However, the second video in the series is where I'm going to look more seriously at the storytelling side of the equation. Now before I get going, there's one more thing that I want to say, and that is... Part of this video is going to have some heavy topics. I'm going to be talking about some of the emotional things that people with disabilities might deal with, and I'm also going to be talking a little bit about abuse and neglect in this video. These are not easy topics to discuss, but I feel like if we're going to represent people with disabilities well, that these are things that we need to be familiar with, that we need to understand, and we need to think about when we are storytelling, so I am including them in this video. Now, I have put the heavier topics towards the end of the script, and I will give you a warning before we start diving into those things, but I just want anyone who is watching this video to be aware that I am going to address those at least a little bit during this video. With that in mind, there are six things that I'm going to be discussing in this video when it comes to understanding disabilities. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology and language. I'm also going to focus in a little bit on the idea of a spectrum, or an umbrella diagnosis. You may hear me use both of those terms in this video. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's known as person-centered thinking, and then I'm also going to discuss communication issues that arise when we deal with people with disabilities. Another thing I'm going to discuss is the idea of confusion and how that plays into the emotional state of people who have disabilities. And then the last topic in this video is going to be the concept of abuse and neglect. Throughout this video, I'm going to be offering both real-world advice for relating to people with disabilities and also some gaming tips, some things to consider if you're interested in introducing a character who has a disability into your game. So, let's get started. One of the things that I have observed is a lot of people are very nervous about interacting with people with disabilities. There seems to be a hesitancy for a lot of people, even a lot of well-meaning people. What do I say? How do I approach them? How do I relate to them? These concerns seem to be pretty common. And honestly, I think part of the reason that these concerns come up so much is that the language around disabilities can be a little bit complicated. So really quick, I want to talk about some of the terminology related to this field just to give you a launching point for discussing these issues. Up first, let's talk about the word disability. What does that mean? Now, you might think from the way that the word is constructed that it means non-ability. 
a complete lack of the ability to do something, but professionally that's not actually how the word is used. Disability can actually cover a wide variety of things, and professionally when we talk about a disability, what we're talking about is when somebody needs support in a specific area of their life in order to function normally in that area of their life. A simple example would be mobility. If a person has limited use of their legs or cannot use their legs at all, they may need a wheelchair some of the time or all of the time in order to get around. The focus of the term disability is not on how much use they have of their legs, but rather on the fact that they need that particular support, the use of a wheelchair, in order to function normally day by day. From there, disabilities can be broken down into a number of different categories. You can have intellectual disabilities, you can have physical disabilities, you can have developmental disabilities. I imagine you can probably think of many examples for intellectual and physical disabilities yourself, but the term developmental disabilities may be a bit new to you, so I'll break that one down a little bit. A developmental disability is a disability that presents before someone has fully developed into an adult. So, in the United States, it basically boils down to a disability that a person acquired before they turned 22 years old. And you'll notice again here that that covers a range of conditions. A developmental disability that could be something that happened before a person was even born, or it could be something that occurred a little bit later in their life, such as a traumatic brain injury from an accident or a wreck. As long as the condition presents itself before the person has fully developed into an adult, it's considered a developmental disability. Again, you have this very broad scope. From there, you can begin to break intellectual, physical, developmental disabilities down into examples of a specific diagnosis that a person might have. The organization that I worked with is very famous for working with people that have cerebral palsy. And you may notice a pattern developing here. Cerebral palsy is still a very broad term. If you look at those two words, cerebral means brain, and palsy is a weakness of the muscles. So, cerebral palsy is a diagnosis that something has happened to someone's brain that has affected their muscle tone. Once again, you have a term being used to describe what could be potentially a number of different situations. This highlights one of the most important things to understand when discussing disabilities, which is that disability covers a spectrum of different situations, a spectrum of different conditions. Even two people who have the same medical diagnosis could present very differently just based on the particulars of their health or their life or what has happened to them. When we talk about the subject of disability, one of the things we need to guard against is the human habit to try to lump everyone into one particular definition. It's important to realize that disability can take a number of different shapes, a number of different forms, it can look a number of different ways, and we need to avoid trying to paint everyone with a disability with just a single brush. A good example of this is the bias that people have where they will often lump physical and intellectual disabilities together even though that's not necessarily something that is going to be concurrent. Imagine tomorrow that you take a really nasty fall and you end up in a wheelchair for a while as your body recovers. Has anything happened to your brain? Of course not. Sitting in a wheelchair has nothing to do with your mental faculties. And yet, many people, when they see somebody in a wheelchair or with some other physical disability, they will automatically assume some sort of intellectual disability at the same time. That is not necessarily the case. By the same token, people who struggle with intellectual disabilities or other forms of invisible disability will often find this bias where people assume they don't have a disability because they don't present physically with whatever their condition may be. I have a very good friend who has a seizure disorder who has encountered a lot of difficulties with employment over the years because frequently their employers act as if they don't have a seizure disorder because there's nothing physically wrong with the person. It's really important that everyone who has a diagnosis of a disability is going to present differently and we should not automatically assume 
that if somebody has a disability that it has to manifest a certain way. This is a very broad topic covering many different people in many different walks of life. But what is quite possibly the most important thing to recognize about the word disability is something I've actually mentioned several times already. A disability is, at the end of the day, a medical diagnosis. And that's it. If somebody has a disability, it is a medical recognition that they need a particular type of support, and that's all that it says about the person. Let me give you an example of why this is important. I have a medical diagnosis of diabetes. That is something that I have and that I will have for the rest of my life. And yet, none of the people watching this video are going to default to referring to me as Mark the Diabetic. You know me as Mark the Local Disaster Tour Guide. You know me as someone who is passionate about RPGs as a hobby. You know me as someone who enjoys storytelling, who enjoys gaming, and enjoys debating the mechanics of gaming systems. That aspect of my personality stands out in your mind far more than the medical diagnosis I just shared with you. The comparison here is pretty simple and pretty obvious. A disability is just a diagnosis. It's a statement of the support that a person needs. It's not a method of defining who the person is. It doesn't cover their interests, their dreams, their goals, their talents, anything like that. So, when we discuss people with disabilities, one of the main things I want you to realize is we're discussing people. That's truly it. The disability may be relevant in certain situations, but when it's not relevant, the person is there and we should be focused on who that person is. This leads us to the first two gaming tips that I'm going to give in this video. Number one, if you want to represent a person with disabilities in your RPG games, it is important to create a character, not a caricature. And number two, because disabilities represents a spectrum of possible conditions, you have a variety of options for portraying a person with disabilities in your game. And, as a quick piece of advice, if conversations about disabilities are new to you, it's completely okay to start with milder examples of disability before moving into heavier examples in your game. It's okay when you're learning about an issue to keep it simple. So, for example, a pirate with a peg leg and a person who uses a wheelchair to get around both have mobility issues, and if you're wanting to portray a character who has mobility issues, the pirate with the peg leg may be an easier place to start. Now, <clears throat> now let's focus in on that number one rule that... <clears throat> so, <clears throat> now let's focus in on that number one tip that I gave you. You want to create a character, not a caricature. Remember that I said a disability is ultimately just a medical diagnosis. It is something that a person has, but it does not define who they are as a person. Just like diabetes does not define me as a person, using a wheelchair or having a seizure disorder would not define somebody as a person either. We are all complex beings with goals and dreams and emotions, with successes and failures, with a variety of different things that are all wrapped into who we are. One of the big challenges in the field of working with people with disabilities is that people often try to define a person with a disability by their disability. They try to act as if the wheelchair that a person is using is the only thing that defines that person, which is obviously foolish. When we think about this in gaming terms, that means that if the only definition you have for your character is their disability, then they're not a character. They're a caricature. They're flat, they're one-dimensional, and they don't add anything to the game. You want to develop a full-fledged character who has a realized personality. Yes, they may have a disability that is part of who they are as a character, but it is far from the only thing that defines the character. And there is a really easy test that you can use to figure out if you have a character or a caricature. What do you think of first when you think of your character? Their disability? Or their name? 
I wish I was exaggerating here, but this is actually related to something that I used to teach my volunteers. It's something we call person-centered thinking. It is a way of approaching care for people with disabilities where we put the person at the center of our decision making. Yes, the disability is relevant, but the disability is only part of who they are, and so we try to see the whole person. And one of the things we try to emphasize for people is using their names. They're not that guy in the wheelchair. They're not that lady who has a seizure disorder. It's John. It's Jeffrey. It's Jacob. It's Mary or Rachel or Ellie. Seeing them as a person, knowing their name, referring to them by their name, is one of the first steps in treating people with disabilities well. You know, earlier I talked a lot about the terminology surrounding disabilities, and you may have noticed that that language probably seemed like I was using really generalized language to try to describe really specific situations. And to be honest, frequently that is the case when you're talking about people with disabilities. The terminology can be overwhelming just because of the challenges of how to use language to describe what a person is dealing with. In fact, one of the questions you'll hear a lot in the field of disability care is, what is the right terminology to use for somebody? And you can debate whatever title you think is the most appropriate, but I'll just go ahead and tell you, you'll almost never go wrong using their name. Working well with people with disabilities in this world and representing people well with disabilities in our games comes down to seeing them first as people who have a diagnosis rather than people defined by their diagnosis. But that leads pretty naturally into the next thing that I want to talk about, which is the subject of communication. Not just how do we talk about disabilities, but how do we interact with people who have disabilities. Communication can actually be a common hurdle for people with disabilities. It's natural here to think about the extreme cases of people who are entirely nonverbal, and certainly that does apply, but it is worth noting that many people who have a disability of one kind or another will often have some kind of hurdle when it comes to communication. Earlier I talked about cerebral palsy and how things that happen to somebody's brain can cause weaknesses in the muscles, and if you think about a loss of muscle tone, that could potentially impact a person's ability to speak and enunciate clearly. It's not just people who are completely deaf that have limits when it comes to communication, Oftentimes, for many people who have a disability, there is going to be some barrier of communication. Whether it is clarity of speech or the loss of the ability to speak, whether it is a loss of hearing or other difficulties related to understanding what other people might say, there are a number of different ways that communication can potentially be difficult for people with disabilities, and this often becomes the invisible hurdle that keeps people with disabilities from being able to participate in normal activities. So this raises the question, how can we communicate well with people who have disabilities? And the number one rule here is patience. People with disabilities have a variety of ways to communicate, but quite often people who don't have disabilities don't show the patience to give them the chance to communicate. Now, let me go ahead and give you the really cool part of this conversation. If you and I are patient when we're trying to learn to communicate with someone who has a disability, the great thing is they are extremely patient with us. I remember when I first started working with the nonprofit that serves people with disabilities, I was really, really nervous that the people I was working with were going to get frustrated with me. I remember one individual in particular, even though they were verbal, when they got particularly emotional or excited, their pitch would often get really, really high to the point that it was very difficult to make out what they were saying. And I remember when I was first learning to communicate with them that I just, I felt terrible because I would ask them to repeat themselves five times, six times sometimes seven, eight, nine, ten times in a row before I finally was able to figure out what it was they were saying, I, I remember thinking, they're going to hate me because I can't figure out what they're trying to say. And it took me about 
three or four months working with this particular individual before I realized they never once got mad at me. They knew that I was making a genuine effort to communicate. They knew that they had trouble communicating and they were more than willing to be patient with me as I learned to communicate with them. If you're willing to show a little patience, I guarantee you that they're going to be willing to show a little patience as well, and you can work through whatever challenges you may have in communication. Now, there are a number of other principles that we can talk about when it comes to communicating with people with disabilities, and one of the big ones here is nonverbal communication. Paying attention to the way a person gestures, paying attention to the facial expressions that they make, things like that can go a long way to reading their intent and figuring out what it is they're trying to communicate or figuring out what it is that they're trying to tell you. Sign language is not the only form of nonverbal communication out there. There are plenty of other tools and tricks that you can use to understand what people are trying to say. Also, don't overlook things like writing stuff down on a piece of paper. There are plenty, <clears throat> there are a number of, there are a number of easy, simple ways you can get around communication hurdles if you're willing to be patient and take the time to do it. Now, there is an important principle that I want to talk about here that is especially important when you're dealing with people who might be nonverbal, which is talk to the person. Sometimes when you have people with disabilities, they will have a caretaker or a friend who is with them or somebody that is helping them in some capacity, and it is really easy to talk to the friend or to the caretaker about the person and honestly, that just feels terrible. Imagine if you were at a party and everyone kept talking to your best friend about you but never talked to you. It wouldn't feel good. When you interact with someone who has a disability, even if they have a caretaker or a friend or someone who is assisting them, it is best to talk to them directly and the other person can help any gaps in communication, but you still want to make sure that you're acknowledging the person that you're actually talking to. Now, that's a lot of tips about talking to people in the real world, but what can this inspire when we talk about people with disabilities in role-playing games? Well, if you're thinking about adding a character who has a disability to an RPG, one of the things that you can think about is, do they have any challenges in communication? This could be a really easy way to add some depth or complexity to your character that can reflect some of the real-world challenges that people might have in this area of their life. Does your character rely on sign language to communicate? Or do they carry around a chalkboard and a piece of chalk so that they can write out what they want to say? Think about different ways that your character might be able to communicate with their friends and with their allies beyond just speech. This is a simple detail that can actually add a lot of depth to your character without requiring a lot of mechanical changes to your character sheet. Now, this is the point in the video where I'm going to start diving into topics that can potentially be a little bit heavier, so I just want to give you that heads up. I'm not going to go too deep in the things I'm about to discuss, but I do realize some of these topics may be a little more difficult. However, I think they are still worth addressing. Next up, I want to talk about the emotional experience of people with disabilities. Now, let me just state up front, people with disabilities are just like you and I. They have the same emotions that you and I have. They have love and joy and hope. They have fear and anxiety. Every high and every low that you and I experience, they experience too. We are all human in that regard. A person with a disability is not necessarily going to be always happy or always angry or stuck anywhere else on the emotional spectrum, just like you and I they experience the full range of emotions. However, there is one emotion in particular that I want to talk about that I feel like is an important theme in understanding the experience of people with disabilities, which is confusion. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had something happening in your life that you just couldn't put into words? You didn't understand what it was, you didn't know how to express it, but there was just something wrong or there was just something off and you wished that you could share it with the people that you loved and that loved you, but just there was something that prevented you from being able to discuss it. Have you ever 
had that experience? Well, let me say, that is an experience that is pretty common for people with disabilities. One thing to understand about the subject of disabilities is not everyone that has a disability knows that they have a disability. We are living in a wonderful time where we are learning a lot about disabilities and information for people with disabilities is becoming available at a fantastic rate. But there are plenty of people who are living with disabilities that may not even realize what's going on in their life. Several years ago, I was training a volunteer and I was actually instrumental in helping one of the volunteers I trained learn that they had a seizure disorder. They had lived with it their entire life and it was something that I said that actually sparked the journey of discovery that led to them getting that particular diagnosis. Or, here's another example. Last year, I was diagnosed as having an anxiety disorder. And when I received that diagnosis, it was like a light bulb turned on for the first time in my life and things that I had been struggling with at least since middle school suddenly made sense in a way they had never made sense before. I had been living with a disability and I didn't even know it. Wait. You're telling me that it's not normal to have panic attacks if there's more than five people in a room? Huh. Probably should have figured that one out earlier. I have been teaching people about disabilities. I even helped one of my volunteers recognize that they had a disability. And still, I was surprised when I discovered that I had a diagnosis that qualified as a disability. It is a very real experience for people with disabilities to experience a lot of confusion. They may know something's wrong, but they may not understand what's wrong or why it's wrong. And then, even if somebody knows that they have a disability, they might not understand why they have a disability. Throughout human history, people have sought all kinds of crazy explanations trying to understand why disabilities might exist. But to go even a step further than that, <clears throat> Someone might know that they have a disability, they might know where their disability comes from, and they still might experience confusion in their life because they're not sure how their disability is going to impact them. I've mentioned before that I serve as a chaplain for developmental disabilities, and one of the things I do is I help people get connected to churches that they're interested in participating in. And I remember a scenario several years ago where there was a lady who used a wheelchair and she found a church that she loved. She loved the pastor, she loved the people. It was a perfect fit for her. She was excited about joining the church and the church was excited about having her. And then she found out that their bathrooms were not actually wheelchair accessible and ultimately was not able to attend the church. The church had tried to make their bathrooms wheelchair accessible but the bathrooms were not properly designed and ultimately wouldn't work for her. One of the sad realities for people with disabilities is even in communities that are warm and welcoming to them, they may encounter problems that ultimately are a hurdle for them to participate. Imagine the confusion of living in a world where you don't know if the building that you want to go to is designed to accommodate your needs. As you can see, confusion can be a pretty serious struggle for people with disabilities. They might not know what's happening to them, and if they do, they may not know why. And even if they understand both of those things, they may not know how they will be received when they go somewhere, and they may not know where to find services that can accommodate to them. Now, obviously in the real world, we want to advocate for better understanding for people with disabilities, and we want to advocate for better public spaces and better public services so that people with disabilities don't have to worry about whether or not they can find adequate accommodations. But when we talk about role-playing games, this is another area where there's actually some good role-playing potential. If you want to role-play a character with a disability, one question you may want to ask is, does this character understand their condition? Do they understand its cause? And do they understand the impact that it's going to have on the things that they want to do? 
introducing some confusion to your character is a really good stepping stone to role-playing a character who has a disability. But now I want to move on to the last topic for this video, and this is definitely a heavy topic. The topic of confusion may have been stressful, but it also can give some inspiration for role-playing ideas. This next topic is far less inspiring. The statistical reality is people with disabilities are far more likely to be targets for abuse or neglect. It's a well-known fact that abusers like to target people who are invisible in society. The people that everyone overlooks are the people who are the most likely to be targeted for abuse or targeted for neglect. And that is very true for people with disabilities. People with disabilities are often overlooked and as a result are far more likely to be targeted in this way. From time to time in my videos, you will hear me advocate for people to be volunteers, for people to get out and serve their community and help others and help make their community a brighter place. And one of the reasons I advocate so strongly for volunteerism is because I have personally witnessed volunteers that I have trained catch abusers and protect people that I know and care about. The number one thing that keeps people safe, people with disabilities, people without disabilities, the number one thing that protects us is a strong community around us. And that is why I am such a big advocate for people getting out and building relationships with people all around the community. One of the things that helps protect people with disabilities is when they have a strong community around them. The reality is people with disabilities are more likely to be targeted and any kind of abuse you can think of has been directed towards people with disabilities in the past. And let's just go ahead and be honest about our gaming tables. Abuse and neglect are probably really strong X card material. I imagine there are very few gaming tables that are interested in portraying abuse, that are interested in portraying neglect. There are very few gaming tables that are interested in having these elements in their stories. This is heavy material. The idea that a person with a disability might be targeted for abuse, might suffer neglect, that is something that just, it hurts. It crushes your soul to think about. And this is one of the areas where disabilities and storytelling can get really messy if we don't think about it and talk about it before we add it to our games. You see, role-playing games generally feature very dangerous scenarios and let's be honest, hardly a game session goes by where violence is not part of what we are portraying in the games that we play. So, let me ask you a question. How comfortable are you with the idea of a person in a wheelchair being targeted with violence? That's pretty uncomfortable, isn't it? If we want to include the subject of disabilities in our RPG stories, this is something that I strongly recommend you talk about with your group before you ever insert a character with a disability. Anyone who is close to someone with disabilities, anyone who is familiar with this field, has probably seen an instance of abuse or an instance of neglect. And honestly, it's really upsetting material. The idea of someone with a disability being abused is something that makes me upset. It's, it's something that, honestly, I would have a hard time with if it was being portrayed in a game that I was playing. So, if you're a game master who wants to include an NPC with a disability, or if you're a player who wants to play a character with a disability, one of the conversations that you and your group need to have is, how comfortable is your group portraying this? I'll try to keep this as spoiler light as I possibly can, but recently in the show Critical Role, this issue has come up. Matthew Mercer introduced a character who has a disability and, in my opinion, the character was very well done. This character became very popular in the show. A lot of people love this character, but 
twice recently this character was put in situations that were very dangerous, potentially deadly, and there was a lot of backlash from the Critical Role community when this character was in danger, and the second time it happened, Matthew Mercer actually went out of his way very soon after to clearly state that that character had survived the dangerous situation that they were in. I'm not taking a dig at Critical Role here. They've actually had some fantastic examples of portraying people with disabilities on their show, but these two situations that have come up kind of highlight this issue. People enjoyed the presence of that character, but when story elements put that character in danger, suddenly people were very uncomfortable with what was happening. This is why I strongly recommend if you want to represent characters with disabilities in your stories, you definitely need to talk with your table about how comfortable people are with the idea of someone with a disability being put in a dangerous situation. By the way, to go back to a point I made earlier, you may remember I talked about starting with milder examples of disabilities before trying to represent more severe issues. That point actually helps safeguard against the issue we're talking about here. A pirate with a peg leg is one way to portray someone who has a disability, and that character is probably going to be one that you and the other players at your table are going to be reasonably comfortable putting in dangerous situations. It's hard to know where the right line on this issue is, and it's going to be different from group to group, but this is definitely a point that you want to discuss with your group, and it's probably something that you want to test out very lightly at first to make sure that you're not making the other players at your table uncomfortable. But with all of that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up. I realize that this is already a lot of information and this video is starting to run long, and it's probably pretty clear that I have only briefly skimmed the surface of the different things you want to think about when it comes to understanding disabilities and representing them in RPG stories. One thing I can strongly encourage you to do is spend some time researching things for yourself. Since it's Autism Awareness Month in the United States, I want to go ahead and highlight a special event that's going to be happening at the end of this month called Color the Spectrum. A YouTuber named Mark Rober is teaming up with Jimmy Kimmel and a whole bunch of other celebrities to help raise money for autism. And I'll try to throw some links down in the description if you're interested in checking that event out. I strongly encourage you to spend some time just researching some of these issues for yourself. Since Autism Spectrum Disorder is on the front of everyone's mind right now, one of the authors that I can strongly recommend is Temple Grandin. I've really enjoyed reading several of her books and I've even attended a few of her presentations and that has gone a long way in helping me learn about Autism Spectrum Disorder. When it comes to the subject of disabilities, we are living in a truly wonderful age because we are learning information about disabilities at a truly incredible rate. There are so many things I wanted to include in this video that ultimately I didn't include just because of how fast information is moving in this particular field. But I do strongly encourage you to spend some time reading up and learning and just discovering information about these issues. We are truly in a golden age of just expanding what our society knows about the subject of disabilities, and it is a truly fantastic time to be learning more about these topics. I know that some of the conversations in this video have been a little bit heavy, but I do want to re-emphasize here that I think it is a wonderful thing that the RPG community as a whole is beginning to take seriously the subject of disabilities and storytelling. I think it is wonderful that we are becoming more intentional about inviting people with disabilities to game with us. I think that it is wonderful that we are talking about how to adjust our games so that people with disabilities can play with us. And I even think that it's intriguing seeing the different ways that game designers are representing characters with disabilities in their stories. I truly believe that this is going to have a net positive effect on the stories that we tell at our gaming tables. And it is that subject of storytelling that I plan on addressing in the next video. Now that we have at least a simple understanding of the subject of disabilities, the time has come to talk about how we can use the subject of disabilities to enhance our stories. 
Yes, there are some heavy things that we have to consider, but I also think that our community will see some serious benefits because we are taking these steps. And in the next video, I'm going to dive into some of the ways I think this will positively impact the stories that we tell. But let me turn the conversation over to you. What are your thoughts on disabilities and storytelling? Are there any questions that you have about understanding disabilities? If there are some questions that you have that I didn't address in this video, throw it down in the comments. I may try to reply in the comments, or I may even do a follow-up video to this one if I feel like there's enough material to do a proper follow-up video. And if you have any questions or suggestions on how to represent people with disabilities in our stories, feel free to leave those in the comments as well. This is a conversation that I truly think is going to be beneficial to the RPG community. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like it and share it. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I invite you to do that and join the local Disaster Tour Guide community. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of the conversation. Have a wonderful day. get on here and do a uh, post credits channel update. So the past week for this channel has been absolutely amazing. Um, I just want to say that this past week has truly just, it has blown my mind. I have been just overwhelmed by all of the wonderful things that have been happening this past week. For those of you who have been with this channel for a little while, you may remember three weeks ago I was just on top of the world because I hit my secret goal for the channel, which was 100 subscribers. You know, I said I'm going to do this thing, and if I hit a <clears throat> and if I hit 100 subscribers, then you know maybe it's something I can take seriously. And I didn't know if it was going to happen, and then. I hit 100 subscribers and I was just so excited that the channel had grown so much. And earlier today my channel hit 630. <laughs> um, I'm truly speechless. Uh, this past week has been amazing. On Sunday, I posted a video responding to a video on No Nat One's channel, and I truly did not anticipate how well that video was going to do. And I just have to say, I have been overwhelmed by all of the positive responses that have come from that. The Redditors who saw my video and sparked a fantastic conversation and sent a whole bunch of people my way, and then Nonat himself actually saw my video and responded and reached out to me and we got to talk a little bit. I, I just want to say that Nonat was incredibly kind and encouraging and I was just really blown away by how positive he was. And then he sent a whole bunch of people to check out my channel and, and yet again, I got to just see all of these incredible positive responses. There have been so many kind and encouraging words sent my way this past week. I just want to say thank you guys so, so much. My wife and I are truly overwhelmed by just all of the kind things that have been said to us. This has been a wonderful week for us. And that kind of raises the question of what is next for this channel. And I will be honest, I don't know what the true answer to that is yet. I have shared on this channel before that I do chaplaincy and volunteer coordination for an organization that serves people with developmental disabilities. And that is who I am. That is my main job. But after every positive thing that has been happening this past week, my wife and I sat down and we had a serious conversation and we're willing to make this a side hustle. <laughs> I don't know what all of this means for the channel yet. I have had suggestions to get a Discord 
and I've had different suggestions from other Pathfinder 2E content creators about what I can do and where this channel can go and truth be told at this moment I can't tell you exactly what this means for the channel but I just want you all to know that I am incredibly encouraged and I am so excited to see where this channel is going to go. This channel started out as an experiment just to keep me occupied during the pandemic. This was more about my mental health and not going crazy from boredom. And it's turned into this positive and vibrant community that I am absolutely loving. So I just wanted to let you all know that my wife and I, we are looking at where we want to go with this channel, what we want to do with it. We are going to try to expand this channel and build on all of the wonderful things that have been happening. And I will do my best to keep you posted on what that's going to mean for this community. And that leads me to what has to be my favorite thing from this past week. One of the commenters on my video Sunday was AJ Harrison, I hope I got your name correct, and he said this is the greatest crossover in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition cinematic universe. AJ, I want you to know I was laughing for like three hours from that comment. It, it just made my day. I don't know if the Pathfinder 2E cinematic universe is a real thing or not, but I will say this, I don't know if the Pathfinder Cinematic Universe is ever going to be a real thing or not, but um, Paizo, if you're listening, I'll gladly play the wizard. And since the Pathfinder 2E Cinematic Universe is now apparently a thing, that means that we have to have post credit scenes. So from time to time, I'm going to be popping in in the post credits of my videos just to make channel updates and let you know some of the things that are going to be happening with this channel and with the local disaster tour guide community. I may tease upcoming videos or give you an idea about projects that I'm working on. I even hope to occasionally highlight some of the upcoming projects that other Pathfinder 2E content creators may be doing on their channels and give you an idea of some of the things that may be coming from them. But one of the things that I plan on doing with every post credit scene is advocating for volunteerism. I'm being serious when I say I have seen volunteers truly change their community and make a huge difference in the world around them. Volunteerism is something that I'm very passionate about and volunteerism is something that I want to encourage you to strongly consider. If you have never tried volunteering before, it can change your community and it can change your life. In the coming months, the restrictions from the pandemic are going to begin to lift and when they do there are going to be organizations in your community and looking for people to help them get back into the wonderful work that they do. This year is a fantastic opportunity to step into the world of volunteerism if you've never done so before and so expect to hear me say the following phrase quite a bit in post credit scenes. Volunteers truly are superheroes they change their community, and they change the world. But you know, now that I think about it, if this is a post credit scene, then I should be teasing something that's going to be coming up on my channel, and I didn't do that. Or did I? Have a great day!